Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session in American English Live Series 17. We missed you. It's been a while, and we're so excited to see all of you here with us today. My name is Kate, and I'll be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Elena, who will be the moderator, helping answer your questions and responding to your comments during the session. Let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, Drama-Based Activities to Improve Student Confidence and Motivation with Carmela romano Gillette and Derek McNish. So Cesar in Peru wrote, it was a great webinar. The importance of lowering the affective filter is something we should always focus on to make students, to make sure students are ready for learning to take place, including drama-based activities definitely serves this purpose. Thank you so much, Cesar, for that wonderful comment. And we have Enoch in the De Democratic Republic of Congo. What I found really interesting is the idea of using improv. I will use it with my first year nursing students in a scenario where they have to respond to patients quickly in an emergency room. That is amazing. What a wonderful application that you'll be able to use in your context. And we have Abreen in Pakistan who wrote, the session helped me to introduce dramas, theater, and fun games in my English language classes. Thank you very much, American English educators, for teaching and training the community in the best possible manner. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for those great comments. We love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development, so please continue to share your thoughts about our webinars by offering feedback through the end of session quiz form or by emailing your ideas to AmericanEnglishWebinars at FHI360.org. We hope to feature one of your comments during the next series. Throughout, uh, throughout series 17, we will be exploring the themes of critical thinking and inclusive practices in ELT. We hope you are able to use the practical ideas we share. Are you eagerly awaiting one of these sessions? Let us know in the chat. So here's what to expect today. The session is about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. So please share your thoughts, questions, and comments using the comments feature or chat box. And when our, excuse me, when our session comes to a close, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click, click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. And once you've successfully passed the quiz, you can expect to get your badge via email within about a week. And before we begin, we want to let you know about the Critical Creativity in Action webinar series. These webinars demonstrate how to use the Critical Creativity in Action resource, which is a new free resource available on the American English website. The next webinar is on Tuesday, May 23rd, so next week on Tuesday. Participants will learn more about the resource, explore the included teacher's manual, and practice their critical creativity skills using the resource card deck. The session will take place at 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. on the American English for Educators Facebook page. You can check the start time using the link being shared by the moderator now. So that is a separate webinar series just special for that new resource. And now for today's webinar, four reading tasks to promote critical thinking. Educators around the world are constantly encouraged to teach critical thinking skills to their students. Critical thinking is a frequent topic at professional conferences. It's often mandated by government education departments, and it receives a lot of emphasis in learning materials. But when it comes to reading skills, students often seem to read with only the goal of finding the answers to the comprehension questions printed in their textbook. Many students read the words without considering the implications of what they are reading, and critical thinking is absent. To help teachers address this problem, this webinar will describe four simple reading tasks that build students' critical thinking skills. We'll consider how to use each task with students of varying ages and proficiency levels. 
Participants leave the session equipped with classroom ready activities to encourage critical thinking in any reading lesson. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Jeremy Beal. Jeremy is a curriculum designer and English language teacher with over a decade of experience working with uh, working in the US and abroad. He began his career in the field of language learning with four years in Indonesia, where he first realized his passion for language and culture. He later returned to Indonesia as a US Department of State English Language Fellow, teaching for three years at Universitas Sam Ratulangi in the city of Manado. In addition to teaching overseas, Jeremy has taught English classes in several schools in Southern California. He holds a master's degree in TESOL from Biola University. Welcome, Jeremy. It's wonderful to have you here with us today. Thank you, Kate. It's great to be here today. I'd like to start today's session with a story from my personal experience as a teacher. Several years ago, I was invited to teach an American history class at a university as a guest lecturer. The students were all undergraduates in the English language and literature department, and they were all non-native English speakers. I arrived two weeks into the semester, so the class had already met once or twice with a different professor. The professor had given them an assignment. Each week they were to find and read an article about American history. So the first day that I taught them, over 100 students handed me their homework, a printout of the article they had read. I suspected that not all of them were actually reading these articles, so I decided to modify the assignment a little bit. Instead of turning in a printout of the article, I told them to give me the reference information for the article and to write one thing they learned from the article and one thing they found interesting. I figured this would be an easy task. It seems like an easy task, right? But I was terribly wrong. The following week, over 100 students again handed me a printout of the article they had read. There were only a handful of students that had actually written something that they learned from the article or they found interesting. I was quite surprised and a bit confused, but I decided that they must not have understood what I wanted. Perhaps because I was a foreign teacher, they had difficulty understanding my English. So I did what any good teacher would do, and I gave them clearer guidelines. I wrote clear directions on the board. I told them not to copy the article, but instead to write down the article reference information along with two sentences. One thing I learned was, and one thing I found interesting was. I also showed them an example. So you can see here the example. There's the title, Why Settlers Moved to America, the author, the web page, and then two sentences. One thing I learned was that the English settlers didn't know how to farm. And one interesting thing is that some Native Americans could already speak English. So I thought that would make things clear for them. But again, I was sadly mistaken. Now take a look at these responses. Um, these are, are not the actual student responses, but they're very similar to, to what I got. So these are for an article about early English immigrants to America. Look at the first response. One thing I learned was they also found that they were in the wrong place. There's not really a lot of context there. It doesn't make a lot of sense by itself. Um, and then the second one, one interesting thing is that the Mayflower sailed back to England in April 1621. I don't know about you, but if I were to choose one interesting thing from a history article, it probably wouldn't be uh, a fact like that one. So basically what the students were doing is taking a phrase or sentence from the article and just copying it to the end of the sentence, uh, sentence start that I gave them. And I was fairly certain that the students had learned nothing at all from their articles. I tried again and again to help the students understand the assignment with the varied results. My favorite was when I received 50 identical papers from one half of the class and another 50 identical papers from the other half of the class. They all met the requirements of the assignment, but as only two students had actually done the work, I was rather disappointed. In the end, only a few students ever grasped the purpose of the assignment. I still don't fully understand why this task was such a problem for that class. Perhaps those students had never been taught to think about and respond to what they read, 
Um, perhaps they were only accustomed to memorizing and copying information. So what I was asking them was something really strange to them. Um, or maybe they just didn't know English well enough to understand the articles that they were reading. But whatever the reason, I think the story illustrates the need to teach critical thinking as a reading skill. I've encountered many students who read without really thinking about what they are reading. In class, they only read with the goal of answering the comprehension questions in their textbook. Um, and often they don't consider whether they agree or disagree with what the author has written or whether the information that they're reading is accurate or not. And so they're not really using critical thinking and that kind of surface reading is really not helpful for them at all. So today we're going to look at four different reading tasks that you can use to help your students learn to apply critical thinking. Uh, all of these tasks are very easy to use. They don't really require any prep or very little prep. Um, they don't have any special technology requirements, so you can use them in any kind of classroom, regardless of what you have available. And they can be adapted for all proficiency levels and all ages. By the end of the session, you'll have a set of activities that can add an element of critical thinking to any reading lesson. So now let's look at an overview of our session. We'll be starting with a definition of critical thinking, or we'll look at a few definitions actually, and specifically how critical thinking applies to reading. And then we'll go into the four reading tasks. Task one, respond to the reading. Task two, apply it to your life. Task three, agree or disagree with an idea from the reading. And task, task four, extend the author's ideas. Before we jump into a definition of critical thinking, I'd like to hear a little bit about your students. What's one way your students need to use critical thinking while reading? Type your answers in the chat. Yeah, let us know everybody, what are your thoughts? What is one way your students need to use critical thinking while reading? Please let us know your answer. I know it's always important for my students to be able to connect what they uh, have experienced or their context to what they are reading. Krishna says they need to be able to ask questions. Very good. What other ways do students use critical thinking while reading? Let's see. Osma says by asking open-ended questions that link their minds to the topic. Great. Raising their own questions from L, relating it to their own experiences. Great. Albanese says asking them to find the moral of the text. Let's see. Shuri says reflecting on the content to connect to their own context. Um, and they should be familiar with intensive and extensive readings from Karima. And they also need to be able to compare and contrast. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Great responses. Yeah, thanks for sharing a little bit about your students. And we'll be looking at some of those things today. So now let's look at some definitions of critical thinking. Um, this, this slide has three different definitions. The first one comes from the Cambridge Life Competency competencies framework. Uh, so this is a document that Cambridge uses when they're designing their materials. Um, and so they have some standards or uh, descriptions of what critical thinking is and what it should look like in their materials. So they divide critical thinking into three parts. One, understanding and analyzing ideas and arguments. Two, evaluating ideas and arguments. And three, solving problems and making decisions. Now, I looked at a lot of different definitions online, and um, many of them have that idea of analyzing arguments, evaluating ideas and arguments. Uh, so that's, I think, a very common definition. Uh, the second definition here is from a blog, um, also on the Cambridge website, and it says the ability of receiving, collecting, and analyzing information effectively. So receiving, I think that means reading and understanding the text, comprehending it, um, for collecting, may, perhaps that means collecting information from several different texts, maybe synthesizing it, putting it all together, and then analyzing the information to really understand it deeply. The third one on here is not so much a definition as an example of um, how you would do critical thinking. And this comes from Elder and Paul, who uh, started the foundation for critical thinking. And I got this from their website. They divided this example into three steps. The first step is to put a concept into your own words. 
The second step is to elaborate on that concept. And the third one is to give real life examples of it. Uh, now, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, but for those who aren't, it's an educational model that shows different levels of learning. As you move up through the levels, each one requires a bit more thinking and shows a greater depth of learning. So at the bottom, you see remembering and understanding information. Those are considered more basic forms of learning according to the taxonomy, but then applying what you've learned, analyzing information, evaluating it, and finally creating something new shows increasing mastery of what you're learning. In regards to reading, the two lowest levels, re remembering and understanding, are about comprehension, about really understanding what you've read. The upper four levels, though, involve critical thinking. Well, let's look at each of those. Uh, applying means to take what you've read and apply it to a new context, um, maybe apply it to your own life. I think a couple of you said earlier that your students need to be able to apply what they're reading to, to their own life. Um, this could also mean taking something you've learned from reading and using it to accomplish a task. The next step up, analyze, uh, could be determining the author's opinion, identifying the reason that the author gives to support his opinion, um, looking at arguments and the way that the, the author phrases those arguments and so on. Next is evaluate. And so this has to do with questions like, is this a good argument? Is this information correct? Is it true? Is it accurate? You can also ask if the story or poem that you're looking at or the article is well written. And then the final level at the top is to create. And so this is where you add your own ideas to the text. Um, it could be uh, responding to a text, extending an argument, maybe producing a counter argument to go against what the text says. Um, or it could even be writing your own text using the, the reading text as a model. Lots of different possibilities. Now, many reading texts now do a good job of including critical thinking tasks. But on the other hand, there are still a lot that are still in use that have zero emphasis on critical thinking. And instead, they just focus on comprehension of the text, which is just the lowest two levels of Bloom's taxonomy here. So students aren't really required to think about what they're reading. But even with good reading materials, we as teachers often need to come up with additional reading tasks to help our students really think about what they're reading and to help them develop and apply critical thinking skills. So now I'd like to know a little bit about the materials that you use. What reading materials do you use in your classroom and how well do they address critical thinking skills? Let us know everybody. What reading materials do you use in your classroom and how well do you think they address critical thinking skills? We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you use. Valentina says she uses adapted graded readers. Yep. What else? RAZ, let's see, Reading Explorer, Storybooks. The storybooks address critical thinking quite well from Krishna. Joelma says, I use a textbook and an article sometimes. Lorraine says, I usually use readings from the textbook, but for additional reading, I will choose some academic essays. And let us know also how you think these uh, help your students to understand critical thinking skills or to address critical thinking skills. Let's see, a couple more responses here. Let's see, uh, magazines and articles related to the topic we're studying from Alejandra. And Samreen says, I use articles and sometimes newspapers. And Graciela says, I create my own examples of readings. Sometimes it works. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Yes, thank you for sharing. Um, and I see that many of you do use articles or essays or newspapers and things, materials that don't necessarily have those questions built in. So um, hopefully you can use some of the tasks that you learned today to help use critical thinking with those as well. But before we jump into the reading tasks, there are a few points to keep in mind for any of these reading tasks. Um, the first one is the age and proficiency level of your students. So these tasks assume that the text that you use is already appropriate for your student's level and interests. 
And then um, for each of these tasks, we'll look at some ways that you can adapt it so it might work for different ages or ability levels. You also want to consider the format of the task. Do you want your students to respond through speaking or do you want them to give a written response? Um, often it's helpful to have them write their response first and then speak. Um, you can also have them use different ways like uh, moving or uh, some other creative ways to respond as well. And then you'll need to consider the grouping. So do you want your students to work individually, in pairs, in groups, or even do something as a whole class? And then the third consideration here is grammar and vocabulary. So think about the grammar and vocabulary that are required to do each task. And if you want to teach any of that beforehand to help the students uh, do a better job with the task. Now we'll look at examples of each of these later as we discuss each task. One other consideration is assessment. Um, I don't generally use these tasks for formal assessment, but instead I use them to develop students' critical thinking skills and also so I can informally assess their progress. But if you want to use some of these for assessment, I think they could be easily adapted uh, to become a more formal assessment to see how well your students are using their critical thinking skills. So next, we'll look at the reading tasks. I'll be giving some specific examples to illustrate each task, but keep in mind that you'll want to adapt those to the needs of your students. Now, the first task uh, is to respond to the reading. Students just give their personal reaction to the reading. This is a very basic task, and it's very easy to use with any reading text or with any group of students. You want to give students the opportunity to just react to the reading, to give their honest response to the reading. This has several benefits. So first of all, it starts encouraging students to think about the reading. They're not focused just on answering comprehension questions, but they're they're thinking about what they're reading and forming an opinion about it. Um, and since uh, they're forming an opinion about it, it lets them know that they're allowed to have an opinion about what they read. I think sometimes um, in, in classes, students uh, have to read a certain thing and they don't really get the chance to say what they feel about it. So they're just reading, answering questions, and then moving on to the next activity. A third thing that this does is it breaks the ice. So it, it helps prepare the students for further analysis of the text by getting them to feel more comfortable uh, sharing their opinion about it. Now let's look at some reading prompts. Um, the first prompt here, what do you like or dislike about this story or poem or article or whatever kind of reading that you're doing with them? This question is really great for allowing students to express their opinion about a text. Sometimes students don't really like the material they have to read in class. And by asking this question, we as teachers acknowledge that fact and we make it okay for students to say how they really feel. And this, like I said before, this can break the ice. It can open the door for further discussion and analysis because it makes students more comfortable sharing their ideas. And sometimes their reasons for liking or disliking a passage can also reflect critical thinking. So for example, they might dislike the author's tone um, or they might feel a story is not realistic or accurate in some way. And so then you can talk about that. Well, what's not realistic or what's not accurate? And that involves critical thinking skills. Uh, the second prompt here, how did this poem make you feel? Of course, you can also use this for a story or a newspaper article. Um, the, the last two here are great for nonfiction texts. What part of the article is most interesting to you? And what is something you have learned from reading this? So these encourage students to read with the goal of actually learning something. They're not just trying to answer questions, but they might actually benefit from reading this in some way. Wonderful. So, we just have a nice comment from Sachiko um, who says creating questions to encourage students to respond to the reading is difficult for me and takes so much time. So hopefully, Sachiko, these questions will be helpful for you. You can probably use some of these for just about any story or article. So hopefully that is helpful for you. And Maham just has a nice comment that a teacher can also learn from our students. That's very true. Thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. Let's look now how to adapt the um, adapt these tasks to the proficiency level of your students. So for beginners, generally you want to limit 
how much they actually have to produce um, because they might not yet be have much vocabulary uh, or no very complicated grammar. And so you could have them choose a response from a list of options. Uh, so the first example here, this story makes me feel, and then you give them some options to choose from, happy, sad, bored, interested, and so on. Uh, or the second example, I really like this story because it is, and again, you could give them some options to finish the sentence. Um, I really dislike this story. Um, so options where they just have to circle or write the, um, the words in the blank and then they can share that. For intermediate students, uh, you can get a bit more complicated, of course. Uh, so here's an example of how you might do that. And that's by just having them complete a sentence. I like the part where, and then they finish the sentence there. And this is also a good opportunity to teach some grammar. So with this particular prompt, you might be able to teach them noun clauses because they need to use a noun clause to finish this sentence. And then for advanced students, you can be a lot more thorough or they can be a lot more thorough and give a more free response. So you can give them something that's a lot more open-ended. Like, how do you feel about this story? And give two reasons why. So I think this kind of prompt uh, where students give their response, give their reaction to a reading could cause some challenges in, in your classroom and with different groups of students. So now I'd like to hear about some challenges you think you might encounter. So what is one challenge that, that you might encounter with this type of task? Yeah, let us know everybody. What is a challenge you might encounter? And we had a question from, let's see, from Karima. Should we sub provide some structure in order to help them speak? And I think Jeremy addressed that a bit with those sentence structures that he shared with us. Um, yeah, it might be a challenge if their level is a little bit lower, um, so that might be a challenge. What other challenge might be might you encounter? Catherine says lack of enough books. Angel, Angel says teaching time. Let's see, the students might not know how to analyze. They might feel shy about using uh, English. They might have limited vocabulary from Zhu Li. They might be afraid to make mistakes. Good point from Lorraine. Open-ended questions can be very challenging for my students from Zied. And let's see, my students might mix their language with local language when they speak. That's a good point as well. Um, and Bayar, Bayar says paraphrasing can be a difficult uh, thing for students to do. Thanks everybody, great responses. I can definitely relate to all of those challenges that you've said. And so we're going to look at a, a couple of those challenges. And I think some of the, the solutions can be applied to some of the other things that you shared. So one challenge, students might hesitate to share their true opinion. And I saw in the chat, uh, several of you said something to this effect, that students are reluctant to share their opinion, or even maybe they're uh, shy about speaking. Um, so this is definitely a challenge that we all face. And students might hesitate to share their opinion for various reasons. So one reason would be that they don't really want the teacher to know if they don't like the reading. Um, they feel like maybe it would offend the teacher in some way. That's totally understandable. Um, another reason might be peer pressure. So maybe um, one student speaks up and says, I really don't like this story. It's really boring. But then a student who does like the story, maybe they feel shy about giving their opinion because it's it's different. And they might think that uh, they're the only one with that opinion. So some possible solutions to help getting your students to speak. Um, one idea that would really work well is to have them write down their ideas before sharing. And this can actually address a lot of the challenges that you shared earlier, because um, when they write it down first, they get a chance to really think individually, to organize their thoughts, uh, to use the vocabulary and grammar in the best way they know how to get everything arranged nicely. And there could even be opportunities for you to help students to, to write things correctly. So once they have it written and they feel it's correct, then they, they'll be more willing to, to speak and, and to share their opinion. Um, another idea is to have students share in pairs or small groups. 
it's very intimidating. It's very scary to share in front of the whole class. Uh, but if students are just in pairs or a small group of three or four, I think they'd be a lot more willing to give their honest opinion. Um, and also when they're in pairs or small groups, you as the teacher won't necessarily hear all of their responses in those, in those small groups. So they could, if they feel like they might offend you with their opinion, they can still share it with their, with their peers. Another challenge is that maybe you ask the students something they found interesting about the article or story, and then the students say, nothing was interesting. I thought it was really boring. So what do you do then? Well, you could ask the students why it, it isn't interesting. And this could lead to a little discussion that uses critical thinking. So maybe, um, you know, maybe that it's not relevant to the students. The students feel the topic is just not interesting to, to their age group. Um, and so you could ask them, what would make the text more interesting? Maybe there are some details that are missing from the story and they would say, I, I would like this better if it uh, had this detail or had this kind of, had more action or something. And so that's actually critical thinking. That actually, it gets into the, the top part of Bloom's taxonomy about creating and adding some ideas to the text. Um, a third challenge would be that students say they didn't learn anything at all from the text. So you say, what did you learn? And they say, I didn't learn anything. I already know all of that. Or maybe, maybe they do, or maybe they just don't really care. Um, so in that case, one thing you could do is just ask them to identify a new word or a new phrase or something from the reading. Um, so at least they learn something from the reading. All right, well, let's go on to the next reading task now. Yeah, and let's have, uh, we have a quick question. Um, well, let's see here. One comment from Saw Etar Etalers that think pair share is a very good approach, wonderful. And then Khadija is wondering, um, do you have to do a lot of questioning because sometimes we don't have a lot of time in the classroom? Great, great questions. And and comment that comment about think pair share, I like that. Or, the students think about what they want to say first, they say it to a partner, and then they share it with a, a larger group. That's great. And then about not having enough time, I agree that it can be a big problem. So um, you don't have to have the students do lots of these critical thinking questions in a single lesson. Maybe you just want to do one or two um, critical thinking questions or tasks in a single class, but over time you can build on that and have the students gradually do a little bit more um, or a little bit more complicated or sophisticated critical thinking. So you can space that out um, and then you'll still have time to do um, the questions in the book or the curriculum that, that you're really re required to do. All right. Well, let's go on to uh, task two and that's to apply what you've read to your life. So, this is another basic critical thinking skill, and it goes along with that third level of Bloom's taxonomy, apply. Um, when students apply the reading to their life, they're really just thinking of real life examples connected to the reading. And this has a lot of benefits. Uh, first, it makes reading personal and relevant to students' lives. And we all know that if the students feel that what they're learning is relevant, then they're more likely to pay attention and they're more likely to to keep what they learn, to retain it. Um, so the, the learning is a lot better that way. Uh, this can also reinforce reading comprehension. When you apply what you've read to your life or to a real life context, it, you have to understand it first. And so you as the teacher will be able to tell how well the students can understand it by what kind of response they give. So if they apply it, but they don't really apply it in a way that makes sense, based on what the text says, then maybe you can intervene and, and help the students understand the reading better. And then finally, this can help students learn and use new vocabulary. So as they apply concepts from the reading to their life, they, they'll probably need to use some words and phrases from the reading, and that will help them to learn those words so they can use them in the future. Let's take a look at some sample prompts now. The first one, describe a time when this happened to you. So this could be a great one for a story or a newspaper article, um, especially if it talks about some kind of 
very common experience that most people have, have experienced. Um, the next one here, how is your family similar to the one in the story? How is it different? So here's uh, a way that you could apply something from a story. Uh, you could do this about a family, about a character, um, lots of different options. And then the third prompt here is for an academic text, a nonfiction text. The article says firstborn children tend to do better in school. Is this true in your experience? So a great way to apply some kind of nonfiction, some facts or research that the students are learning to their own lives. Now let's take a look at how you might use this kind of task in your classroom. Here's a simple nonfiction text that you could use with young learners. I'll read it aloud to you and then we'll look at how to use this. Colors can change the feeling of a room. For example, if a room is painted a warm color, like red, orange, or yellow, it will feel warmer. And a room painted cool colors, like green or blue, feels cooler. The color can also affect the mood of a room. A room with lots of red can feel more exciting. On the other hand, rooms that are mainly green make people feel calmer. Now look at the prompt. Since these students are beginners, I'm keeping their response very simple. So the first question is, what are the main colors in their bedroom or in your bedroom? And all they have to do is name the colors. So very simple. Um, and then the second sentence there, my bedroom feels, and then they choose a word, exciting, calm, happy, sad, warm, etc. cetera. Uh, so they really just need to know the meanings of those words and they can respond to this. Now here's a series of steps that I might use for this task. Um, I'm going to first have the students write down their response individually to really give them time to think about it uh, and, and put down a good response. Um, but then I also want them to practice speaking. So for step two, I give them a sample conversation. Very simple, student A asks, what are the main colors in your bedroom? And student B says, my bedroom is red and it feels exciting or something like that. And so you can have them practice this conversation until they can say it smoothly. Um, and then they're ready for the next activity uh, or for the next part of the activity, sorry. Steps three and four are just about demonstrating the task to the class. So I would demonstrate with a student first, and then I would probably have two students demonstrate the activity for the rest of the class, just to make sure everybody understands what to do. And then finally, step five, I put the students in pairs and have them have this conversation with a partner. Then for step six, they're going to repeat it with five different partners and then sit down when they're finished. But this is a very short conversation. It's a very quick task, maybe five minutes from start to finish. So now I'd like you to think about how this text could be used with intermediate or advanced students. So stop and reflect. How would you have intermediate students apply the text to their lives? And how about advanced students? You don't need to type anything in the chat, but just think about what you would do. Kate, what would you probably do uh, for intermediate and advanced students? Yeah, I love this article, uh, this text, and we had some nice comments about the text, um, uh, about uh, how how perfect it would be for for many different types of learners. Um, I would, if I had intermediate students, I would probably have the students describe the colors in their bedroom and how it affects the room, maybe in small groups. Um, and for advanced students, um, I might have the students uh, go into small groups and decide what colors the classroom should be, and then tell the whole class what colors they choose and why. Great. Those are great ideas. Thank you, Kate. So, so let's see what, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Kate. Just seeing if we have some responses here in the chat. Let's see, maybe ask, Samir says you could ask the question, what colors feel good to you and why? Very nice. Um, let's see, I would ask students to define what colors make them feel like. So maybe associate a color with a, an emotion word. Uh, we need to do, 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 we need to give the mic to the students from Adanan. Very nice. And 
Okay, yeah, great idea. The idea of use of what colors mean to different cultures, that is a great idea. Students could discuss that type of thing and see how it might differ from culture to culture. Absolutely, thanks everybody. Great, yeah, thanks for sharing those ideas. Um, so let's look at a little, a little bit about um, the grammar and vocabulary that would re be required for these different prompts. We already looked at the beginning one, um, so that just requires knowing some vocabulary. Uh, for the intermediate students, uh, this is like what Kate said, describe the colors in your bedroom. How do the colors affect the feeling of the room? So here they're describing the colors in their bedroom. So they'll be talking about different parts of their bedroom and what colors those are. So it's a little more complicated than what the beginning students do. Um, and then the second question, how do the colors affect the feeling of the room? That might get them to recycle some of the some of the text, so some of the words and phrases from the text, so they can explain um, how the colors affect the feeling of their room. And then for advanced students here, uh, if you change the colors in our classroom, what changes would you make and why? Uh, so if you look at the grammar required, this is using conditional, so they'd be saying, "I would change it to this," and here's why, um, and it's it's very open ended, of course. All right, well, let's go ahead and look at the next task, reading task three, and that's to agree or disagree with an idea from the reading. Now, simply having students say whether they agree or disagree with the text and then give reasons why is an excellent way to get them to think critically. Uh, this really gets into the heart of critical thinking. Uh, so a lot of those definitions of critical thinking that we looked at earlier talk about analyzing and uh, evaluating the ideas in a text. It also emphasizes the idea that students should be evaluating what they read. They don't have to blindly accept it as fact. Uh, so I think that's really important, especially nowadays when we get so many things from the internet and there are great sources and there are not so great sources. So helping students to question that and determine which sources are better, which ones have um, accurate information. And so basically when they agree or disagree with what a text says, students aren't just reading to understand what it says, but they're forming an opinion about it. Now you can use a prompt like one of these. Uh, the author states that, do you agree or disagree? Why? Very simple. And the next one, how do you feel about the idea that? Give your opinion on a scale of one to five, where one means you strongly agree, five means you strongly disagree. But besides giving this kind of prompt, um, there are lots of creative ways that you can have students express agreement or disagreement. Think about having the students move around the classroom. Think about different ways that they might share their ideas with other students. And so now I'd like you to do just that. What is a creative way to have students express agreement or disagreement with an idea from the reading text? Yeah, we know that many of you out there have um, done a lot of creative things in your classroom uh, to ask students to tell you if they agree or disagree. What are some ways that you've done that? Please let us know. What's a creative way to have students express agreement or disagreement with an idea from the reading text? Shifa says using survey forms, great idea. Anum says you could draw emojis to express your ideas about the reading text. Great. You could have a debate from Yusra. You could have smile, you could have students draw smileys or frownies on mini boards from Jamila. Let's see, mind maps from L, using a quote and pasting it on the board, dividing it in two, brainstorming from Erica. You could propose a controversial theme. Great, from Mansoor. Surveys from Tirana. Six hats. Ooh, I'm interested to know more about that one. Um, and you could have a poll using Mentimeter for an online class from Sabina. What a great idea. So many other creative ideas coming in. I wish I could read all of them. These are wonderful. Thanks, everybody. I'd, I'd love to see what your classrooms look like with all these great ideas. Um, and. Uh, I, I like that about drawing emojis and using mini boards. What a great way for students to be able to respond even with really limited language skills. So uh, wonderful. Uh, so I'd like to share a few other ideas that you might think about as well. Um, 
One idea is to have students move to a part of the room based on whether they agree or disagree. This is one that I often do with my students. I give them a controversial statement from the reading, and then I say, if you agree, stand up and move to this side of the class. But if you disagree, move to this side of the class. Then I choose two or three students from each side to give one reason why they agree or disagree. Um, another way that you could do this is have students write their ideas on the board um, or, or write their re one reason for agreeing or disagreeing, or even maybe brainstorm with a partner and write multiple ideas um, up on the board. Now, you might not have boards that go all the way around your classroom. Uh, so uh, another idea, if you don't have much board space, is just to use paper that maybe you tape up or you set on desks around the classroom so that students can go and write their ideas on those pieces of paper. And then you could have the students, after they've written all of those ideas, they can move around the classroom and look at all of the other students' ideas and even comment on them. You might even have them write some kind of follow-up comment. So in that way, they're exposed to many different viewpoints, um, which is also a part of critical thinking, being able to think from different perspectives. A third idea is to provide a list of reasons that support or go against an idea, um, and then have the students rank them from strongest to weakest, and then discuss why. Why is this a strong idea? Why is this a weaker support for this argument? Um, and you could either write these ideas yourself, or you could have the students generate them, or have the students even find them in the reading. So then it would be uh, a task to analyze the reading and then to uh, express agreement or disagreement. And then one last, one last idea. Um, you can have students share their opinion or reasons with a partner, and then they'll find a new partner and share their partner's opinion and reasons with that student. So kind of like this. I tell my partner, I agree with this idea, and here's why. And they tell me, I disagree, and here's why. Then I find another partner, and I tell them, my previous partner said this, and I said this. And, and so this is just another way to get the students exposed to many different ideas and many different perspectives and get them thinking critically. Well, it's time to move on to the last task. Uh, task four, to extend the author's ideas. Now, this, is, uh, this gets to the very top of that pyramid, that Bloom's taxonomy, uh, to create. So here, students are actually adding something to the text. Um, it, it uses high-level critical thinking because students are asking questions like, what is missing from this text? Or how can this argument be stronger? So in that way, they're really analyzing and evaluating the argument, and then coming up with something new. And you can also adapt this to meet many different language objectives. Now let's look at some sample prompts. So this first prompt would work well for a story. So you extend the story. What will happen next? And I think this one's good for all ages, including younger students. You can use this with very simple stories and just have them write, what, what do you think is going to happen to this character next? Um, and students can respond in speaking or writing or both. The second and third prompts work really well for an essay or an article. And I think they're better for intermediate and advanced level students. So the second idea is to write another example to illustrate an idea. And the third one is to add another reason to support the author's opinion. You could also have them think of evidence that goes against the author's opinion uh, to put some more critical thinking in there. And then the last prompt here, what is something else you think the author should have discussed is a great way to get students to analyze the strength of an, of an argument. So um, what's missing from the, uh, from the author's argument or from their evidence? So that again, gets really gets into higher levels of critical thinking. Um, you could also use this with a story. So what do you feel is missing from the story? Should the author have added different details or told uh, told about something else. Um, and so that's, that's another way to extend the author's ideas. And these are also a great opportunity to improve students' language skills. So let's think about what kind of grammar and vocabulary that you can teach to help students respond to different prompts. Consider this prompt on the screen, add another reason to support the author's opinion. Think for a moment, 
what grammar or vocabulary could you teach so students can give a good response to this one? One possibility would be to uh, teach them some transitions, such as another reason is, or blank is also a good reason because these work especially well in writing or in formal speaking. So if your students need to do that uh, writing or academic writing or formal speaking, these transitions are really great for that. Another possibility would be to teach them noun clauses. Another important reason is that, and then they complete the sentence there with a noun clause. So now it's your turn. Take a look at this prompt. Um, what is something else you think the author should have mentioned? What grammar and vocabulary do students need to give a good response? Go ahead and type your answers in the chat. What do you think, everybody? What is something else you think the author should have mentioned is the prompt? And what grammar and vocabulary do students need to give need to give a good response for this? What would you say, everybody? Let's see, conditionals from Mariana, giving advice from Eduardo. Anna says modals. Sherlock Holmes, like this set condition, the first or second conditional. Object clauses, very good, or noun clauses, great. If clauses from Angela. Let's see. Grammatical signals, parts of speech are needed from Salma, verbs from Sobia. Um, and maybe practice with lengthy sentences because some students uh, need to practice with those added details. All right, thanks everybody. So you can see from your responses that there's really a very wide range to what you can teach with with this particular prompt and really with any prompt. Um, so here's a couple uh, other ideas to think about. I think you mentioned most of these ideas um, uh, for possible teaching points. Um, the first one, present perfect with modals. So the author should have said this. Uh, third conditional, some of you mentioned conditionals. It would have been helpful if the author had discussed this. Uh, so that's a more uh, complicated grammatical structure. And if you have lower levels, you could use something as simple as past tense. The author didn't say this, but it's important because, so um, you can even adapt this for lower levels. Well, to end today's session, um, I, uh, I'd like to first, well, first let's review these four tasks. Um, so task one was to respond to the reading. Task two, apply it to your life. Task three, agree or disagree with an idea. And then task four, extend the author's ideas. Now these tasks can really help students move away from just reading to answer comprehension questions and really get them to think about what they're reading, to really engage with what they're reading. And it'll make reading more useful and meaningful for them. Now, as you use these, remember to consider how you want students to respond, whether through speaking or writing or both. Um, through in groups or individually, uh, maybe moving mo using movement or in some other creative way. Also consider how you can adapt the task to your students' English ability, and then consider what grammar and vocabulary they need to form a good response. All right, to finish things off, I'd like you to take a moment to think over the different tasks that we covered today. So it's a task from today's webinar that, that you might use to help your students develop critical thinking in reading. Yeah, let us know everybody, what is a task from today's webinar that you want to use to help your students develop critical thinking? Let's see here. Expanding the text. What else do you think? Using agree and disagree, great. All four tasks from Valentina. Therese says she loved the first task. Agree or disagree might be an easy place to start from Sanala. Great. Let's see what else. A lot of people seem to like the agree and disagree. That might be sort of a, a nice inroad for starting those critical thinking skills. And of course, many people are saying that they like all the activities and they're going to try them with their students. Questioning and providing activities and sentence prompts, absolutely. And adapting materials based on students' needs. 
applying to your life is my favorite. And one more, Abreem says their description of the environment, like the bedroom colors, et cetera. And so many other great responses coming in. I think we're all going to be able to use these ideas into in our classrooms very soon. Thanks, everyone. Great. Well, it's really been a pleasure sharing these ideas with you today, and I hope that they will be useful to you as you help your students learn to apply critical thinking skills to what they read in English. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Jeremy, for that wonderful session. I, I see lots and lots of comments coming in about how excited people are to use these ideas. And we always love to have you, Jeremy, as one of our presenters and happy to learn more today about how to develop critical thinking skills in reading. And as always, we'd love to thank you, our wonderful, wonderful audience, for your engagement and participation today.